Hidden in every storybook, upside down and backwards round, tucked within the afterword lie the secrets dark and true that fill the pages of the Book of Scary. Listen, children. Turn down the lights. Draw near, lest Yuki Yonna passes tonight. She'll hear you. She hears all. And if you disobey, she'll know. I'll tell you the tale of another who didn't listen. A young woodcutter from the province of Musashi, journeying home alone. The ferryman had abandoned him when the storm began, leaving him to walk for miles in the terrible freezing night. The wind would not stop howling, the snow would not stop whirling, the woodcutter could no longer see his way, and he feared he might meet his death in endless cold whiteness. Until, by rare fortune, he stumbled upon the ruins of a long-abandoned house. Some of its walls were still standing. A door remained swinging in and out, in and out, forgotten, but not useless. The woodcutter wasted no time in claiming this gift of shelter, and he dared not question how it came to be. At once, he rushed inside and tied the door shut. Then he curled up under his coat and rested his head upon his back. Before long, he was fast asleep. An hour passed in peace. Then the woodcutter was jolted awake with a cold blast of snow upon his face. With a cry of surprise, he opened his eyes and saw that the door had flung itself open. Again he closed it. Again he tied it shut. This time he placed his pack against it too. Surely the wind could not open it now. Once more the woodcutter lay down to sleep. But without his pack, the floor was hard on his head. His heart still pounded from the shock of the wind. Sleep did not come easily. And when it came, it was riddled with bad dreams. So it was that when the wind battered his face a second time, he refused to wake. It was only another nightmare, he told himself, and he was so very tired. Only when the wind fell silent did he wake to find he was not alone. There was a woman. Standing over him and dressed all in white with pale skin. Dark hair flowed like water down to her feet. Her lips were a deathly blue. The woodcutter found her beautiful in a ghostly way. But her eyes were so dark they filled him with horror. He could not speak. He could not scream. He could only watch frozen with dread as the woman knelt beside him and breathed cold fog across his lips. His heartbeat, once pounding like drums, began to slow, slow, slow. Yukiana, he thought, I must be dead. But Yukiana, the snow woman, did not kill him that night. Would you believe that instead she kissed him? And when she drew away, she smiled, allowing the poor frightened woodcutter's heart to beat again. I was going to kill you, but now I do not think I want to, she said. I think you are handsome, and I have no wish to be cruel to one so young. She caressed the woodcutter's cheek with icy fingers. A shudder passed through him, but then something changed. Where the snow woman touched him, he felt warm, and she was no longer pale and blue. 
Her eyes took on the light they did not have before, and he found himself wishing for another kiss. W will you stay, he said to her. Yes, said she. I will stay tonight, and I will let you live, but on one condition. You must come to this place in one year's time and become my husband. You must never love another. If you betray me, I will know, and I will punish you. Of course, the woodcutter had no desire to die, nor did he wish for Yukiona to leave. Why, it seemed he could be happy with her for all his days. Yes, the woodcutter made his promise, and the snow woman stayed with him that night. When morning came, she was gone. The door to the house was frozen closed as if it had never been opened. Snow blanketed the woodcutter's eyelashes, and he awoke stiff and cold, his head aching so. But the storm had also gone, and the way home was clear. What a peculiar dream, thought the woodcutter. He told no one about it, and in time forgot it completely. Winter passed and spring returned, bringing with it much promise for the handsome young woodcutter. A pretty girl had come to the village to help her grandfather run the inn, and such a lovely creature she was, petite with a musical voice and doe's eyes always bright from laughter. Our young woodcutter fell in love the first time they crossed paths. One day the innkeeper's granddaughter came by to purchase wood for the stove. The woodcutter was so pleased to see her that he gave her double what she'd paid for and then escorted her back to the inn, and visited her every day after, and helped her with chores without pay, no matter how much she argued and blushed. Until one day, the old innkeeper said to him, Son, go and make her your wife. She's already made a husband out of you. The woodcutter and the innkeeper's granddaughter married that winter, a happier couple there had never been, but on the night of their wedding, the new husband had a strange dream. He saw snow drifting into the house, covering everything, smothering all joy. The woodcutter had never felt so alone or so cold, and yet there was no explanation for this feeling, only endless clinging snow. Then a horrible scream woke him, and he turned in panic to his wife beside him, but she was sleeping. He shook her, and she bolted upright, gasping. Oh! cried his new wife. Oh, it's only you. I had a horrible dream. There was a woman standing here, right where you lie now, and she was pointing at me. She was so sad, and angry too, so angry that she scratched her own eyes out in front of me. The woodcutter felt a shudder that traveled from his head to his knees. Is that what made you scream, he said. Screamed, said his wife. Did I? I don't remember. I was too frightened to make a sound. Perhaps you had a nightmare as well. The woodcutter did not want to discuss dreams any more, for he feared the nightmares were a bad omen. A guilty feeling overcame him then, but he didn't know why. He chose to forget again. He never told his wife of his own dream. But if those dreams were an unlucky omen, they were not about the couple's marriage, for the next few years were happy ones indeed. The woodcutter and his wife never wanted for anything. They never argued. In time they took over the inn. There they lived with their twin children, a daughter named Natsu, and a son named Haru. And here is where our tale takes a tragic turn. Are you still listening? Are you wanting to light the lamps again? You must not do it. Listen when I tell you that when Natsu and Haru were nine years old, a fever took their grandfather from them, and then it took their beloved mother. The woodcutter fell into a deep and black grief from which there was to be no relief for more than a year. He would see no one. He barely ate. 
He let the inn fall almost to ruin, and the children learn to look after themselves. When their father finally emerged from his year of mourning, he was a changed man. There was no joy in him. All life was gone from his face. I have fallen behind in my responsibilities, he told Haru and Natsu. The inn must be reopened, and you children must have a mother. It was only a month before he traveled on business and brought home a bride. Haru and Natsu's new mother was almost as beautiful as the first, but she was cold and false. Her smiles may have fooled their father, but Haru and Natsu knew what they saw, and they did not trust her. Just as they predicted, their stepmother soon dispensed with her mask of agreeability. She disliked work of any sort and made the children do everything for her. She complained constantly about life in the country and demanded new finery all the time just to quiet her constant nagging. I thought you had money. How do you keep up an inn without money? She would say. Oh, if my sisters saw me now, they would laugh at me. But their father threw himself into his work only, keeping himself blind to what went on under his own roof. This made the inn a gloomy place. So gloomy that travelers left as quickly as possible, declaring that the place must be cursed. Then winter came again. The harshest winter seen in all Haru and Natsu's ten years. A relentless blizzard descended upon their village with no foreseeable end. No one came to the inn now. No one purchased wood. The woodcutter's food stores began to dwindle and the snow blustered on. His second wife complained unceasingly of how meager their meals had become. Can we not buy food from the market? she said. With what money? said the woodcutter. Shall I sell your kimono? Of course not, screeched his wife. What is the point of living if everything must be dull and ugly? Can you not go find work in the next town? Who will look after the inn, said the woodcutter. This winter will pass, and we'll see travelers again. Until then, we must learn to live on less. Stepmother suggested they send the children off to work. Or better yet, she said, sell them to some childless family. They eat too much food she said. And anyway, don't you want them to have a better life? But the woodcutter could not bear to lose his children, not after the loss of his first wife. When he refused, his second wife flew into a tremendous rage, and she remained unbearable for days after. If Haru and Natsu committed the slightest, most innocent transgression, she whipped them with a birch branch. If they spoke out of turn, she struck them. When they threatened to tell their father, she promised to feed them to a demon. I know where one lives, she said. She'll cook you and eat you and use your bones for kindling. <laughs> but after a few days of this, she changed without explanation. She became kinder to Haru and Natsu. She let them play more. She let them eat more. Whatever had come over her, Haru and Natsu could not guess. I have been stern, said Stepmother, because I thought it was the right way to bring up bright young children like yourselves. But I see how wrong I was, and now I should like for us to be great friends. Natsu and Haru did not believe their wicked stepmother's words, but if it meant she was kind to them, even a little, they would accept it for now. This was why they did not argue when their stepmother woke them before sunrise one day and led them to the edge of the woods. Come, Haru, come, Natsu, she said cheerfully. I have a secret to tell you. There is a pond deep in the woods where the fish can be found swimming. Yes, even in this season. Go and find it. Your small hands will be able to catch the fish, <laughs> and I will stay here and keep your father busy. Shh, this is a surprise for him, for I have been an unkind wife, and I would so like to make him happy again. Go, children, go. Don't return until you find the pond. Well, the children knew this was some scheme of hers, but what else were they to do? They knew that if they refused, she would become abusive to them again. That was when Haru 
picked up a fallen branch and scratched into the trunk of a tree, making two notches side by side. What are you doing, brother? asked Natsu. Stepmother means for us to get lost in the woods, said Haru. She means for us to die, but we'll outsmart her. Look here. We'll mark each tree we pass, just like this. When we're far enough away that she can't hear us walking, we'll wait until dark, and then follow the trail back home. Father will know what she's done, and then we'll finally be rid of her. Children! They heard their stepmother call. What are you whispering about? You must go now if you hope to find the fish before nightfall. We're just excited about how best to surprise father, Natsu called back. But we're going now, stepmother. Yes, we're going, said Haru. Haru and Natsu walked for miles just to be certain their stepmother wasn't following. Along the way, they marked each tree they passed with the same two notches. Sometimes they stopped to hug one another for warmth against the frigid gusts. At last, the sun started its descent, and the children decided they could safely turn back for home. Too tired to talk, they walked in silence, hearing only the crunch of their footsteps in the snow. But what was this? A curious echo began to follow their steps. No, not an echo, but something that sounded like scratching. Did you hear that, brother? whispered Natsu. It must have been twigs breaking, said Haru. They walked more quietly now, listening. Again they heard it. It was no twig snapping they heard, but scratching. As clear as I speak to you now, Haru and Natsu held their breath, waiting for signs of anyone or anything following them. Could it be stepmother after all this time? A band of thieves. They saw no one and nothing, but still they heard that eerie scratching again and again and again, faster and faster, behind them, before them, all around them. What creature could possibly do such a thing? Was it the demon their stepmother had warned them about? Were they to be its dinner? Haru, look! screamed Natsu, and Haru looked. No! he said. For every single tree bore the same set of notches. Not only the ones along their path, but all of them. What devils had done this? How will we find our way back home now, brother? cried Natsu. Oh, sister, we're truly lost, cried Haru. The wind began to shriek, whipping their faces, freezing their tears upon their cheeks. They watched with dread as a wall of snow swept toward them, a great white beast intent on swallowing them whole. Brother and sister feared they would die before the sun had finished setting. But just as they were giving up all hope, they heard a voice. It was a sweet voice, singing sorrowful songs carried on the wind. So hot is my fire sang the voice, so warm my table, but cold is my heart with no child to comfort. The children followed the voice until they saw the warm glow of lights from a grand house. This house was larger than any they had ever seen, undoubtedly that of some noble lord. Haru and Natsu could already feel the warmth of the fire, and such delightful smells drifted from within. Warm rice, and fish cakes too. Come, let's go closer, said Haru. Gently, slowly, and as quiet as mice, the children slid back the screen and slipped inside. Their eyes widened in wonderment. The room in which they found themselves was packed from floor to roof, with all kinds of cakes and preserved fruits. Dried fish and pork, too, and there was a fire with a kettle full of soup boiling over it. In the storehouse of all places, why, it was too wonderful to be believed. But Haru's hand felt odd. When he looked at it up close, he found little white granules stuck to his fingers where he had touched the screen. Then he turned around and, to Natsu's surprise, lit the screen. Sister, said Haru, 
It's made of sugar. Natsu licked the screen too, and it did taste like sugar. She then moved to the wall and nibbled at it. It's made of cake, she said. Taste it, brother. Have you ever seen such a house? The children ate and ate and ate. They ate until they could not eat any more, until they couldn't help but curl up beside the fire and fall asleep. But when they awoke, they found themselves cold in the darkness of a long shadow. Natsu wanted to scream, but her voice had frozen in her throat. For you see, children, the shadow belonged to the mistress of the house in which they had trespassed. How wealthy this woman must have been. She wore a kimono a hundred times finer than anything stepmother pined over. Her hair, streaked with silver, reached to the floor in a long straight jet, and she was as pale as the snow itself. Two delicate charcoal brows marked her high forehead, and she wore a black silk scarf over her eyes. Stiff. Silent, she knelt over the children, bluish lips unsmiling. It was Haru who spoke first. Please forgive us, madam. We didn't mean to steal. We got lost in the snow and were starving. We were afraid we would die. The lady turned her face to Haru but did not acknowledge his words. We'll work for you, pleaded Natsu. J -j -j Pay for what we took, please, madam, be kind. Our father doesn't know we're here. The noble woman smiled then, showing black lacquered teeth. Hush now, children. I am not angry, she said warmly. Rather, I am grateful to her visitors at long last. I have been so alone all these long years since my lord husband died. Tell me your troubles, children. Though I am but a blind widow, perhaps I can ease your burdens. The children were so relieved they both began to cry. Then they told the widow about their stepmother, their father, and how poor and hungry they were. You poor creatures. There is only one thing to do, said the widow. You must live here with me until the springtime. My servants went away when they could no longer bear this everlasting storm. You will be my helpers. Won't that be lovely? And just before the flowers bloom again, I will return you to your father, and he'll learn the wickedness of your stepmother once and for all. Natsu and Haru agreed to stay with the blind widow and help her around her palatial home. In return, there was plenty of food and a fire always ready for them. Never did they go hungry. Never were they cold. There were times they missed their father greatly, but thoughts of seeing their stepmother thrown out soothed all their sorrows. Indeed, these were the happiest days they had known for a very long time. One day, the widow asked Haru to go into the storehouse for barley. But the barley was not where she said it would be. And so Haru had to walk to the very back and shove aside at least a dozen heavy sacks of rice before he found it. As he dragged a sack of barley away from its place, he heard something sharp scrape along the floor. Investigating further, he discovered a horrible sight, for caught underneath a bag of grain he found a human jawbone. But it couldn't be, he thought. No, it, it must belong to some wild forest creature. Haru went back to where he'd gotten the barley and crawled into its space, where he found even more bones. A rib, some thigh bones, two more sets of jaws, a hand, a child's hand. Haru grabbed a finger bone and ran to find Natsu. Sister, sister, he said, we're in danger. What do you mean, said Natsu? The widow has been so kind to us, what danger could there be? Shh, she'll hear us. Haru whispered, and he told Natsu what he had found. Oh, brother, can it be? said Natsu. It could be, children, and it was. But what did it mean, you ask? Was the blind widow a murderer? They reasoned that she could not be. It must have been her servants. Perhaps it was not the storm that drove them away, but guilt. Surely their mistress hadn't known. But a cold wind rushed through the corridor where they huddled. And on its tail was the widow herself. 
Her feet made no sound, no, she floated, and though her eyes were covered, her face twisted in such fury. Your brother speaks the truth, girl, she said. Many a lost child has wandered into my trap, never the right ones. But you, I am certain of, you are the woodcutter's own. Many years ago, your father betrayed me, and now I will punish him through you. The children screamed and ran, 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 anywhere their feet would take them. But always the widow was on their heels. She seemed to fly without legs at all. This demon of a woman chased them all over the house and then outside of it. Oh, poor Haru and Natsu, running barefoot into the darkness, away from the warmth of the fires they'd come to know as home and into the black unknown. But they didn't make it far before the demon caught them. She held them fast in her grip, grinning with slick teeth. The children were certain they would die, and can you blame them for thinking so? But brave Haru fought hard, clutching at anything he could. The demon's throat, her nose, her ears. At last he grabbed at the scarf over her eyes and pulled then yelled in utter horror, Oh, for behind that scarf were no eyes at all, only two black sockets framed by long, jagged scars. This one has too much fight left in him, I see, said the demon woman, and she grabbed Haru by the ear. He'll be the first into the fire, oh, but not yet. He's still not plump enough, for who will believe such a skinny little creature could be a roast piglet? I want your father to eat you both before I tell him the truth. The woman dragged brother and sister back inside, and she locked the boy in a cage in the storehouse. Yes, she said. We'll feed him a bit longer, and you'll help me, girl, or I'll make it worse for the both of you. For weeks, Haru lived in a cage while Natsu reluctantly helped the demon hag prepare rich foods to fatten him up. Natsu was beside herself with grief. Ah, but clever Haru had devised a plan. You see, children, the blind widow could not see if the boy was getting any fatter. She had to test his weight by feeling his finger through the bars of the cage. Do you remember the finger bone he took before? Well, he kept it, and he would wrap it in the flesh and skin of dried plums. Each time he would hold out his false finger, the demon woman would groan in exasperation. He eats, 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 and still he is but skin and bones. After a time, the widow grew tired of waiting. Even this winter would only last so long. Fat or thin, she would cook the boy that very night. With Natsu's help, she would throw him into the flames of her exceedingly large stove and roast him, skin and all, like a succulent hog. With the strong one taken care of, she'd cook the weaker Natsu next. The time has come, girl. She said to Natsu, Check the stove while I prepare your brother. Haru wasn't the only clever one, however. Natsu had a few tricks of her own. But what could she do while poor Haru, still inside his cage, was being seasoned with spices and fat? Be patient and I'll tell you. Well, said the demon, is it warm enough? Tell the truth now. If it's too cold, it'll only draw out his suffering. I don't know how to check the stove. Natsu lied. We never had such a large one at the inn. Country children, said the demon. Just get on your knees, open the door, and put your arms inside. If it's hot, it's ready. But my lady, said Natsu, how hot is hot enough? I've never cooked before. The demon lady hissed, shuffled to the stove, and pushed Natsu aside. Useless girl, she said. I'll do it myself. Natsu watched as the woman knelt to the floor, opened the iron door of that gigantic stove and felt blindly in the heat. Then Natsu crept up 
behind her and, oh, shoved her hard. The move surprised the wretched demon so completely that she tumbled head first into the flames. Hurry, sister, hurry! Haru shouted as Natsu slammed the iron door shut and latched it, but the widow fought furiously from within. Fearing the bolt might give way, Natsu sat up against it, pushing all of her weight into it even as the hot iron seared her flesh. The pain was almost too much to stand, but she would not, could not dare to let the demon out. Even now, the murderous lady pounded and pounded from inside, her howls of anguish and rage as horrible as the screams of the eternally damned. The pounding slowed, but Natsu held steady. The howling quieted, but she remained until, finally, all was still. Natsu let out a sob of pain before remembering that she still had to free her brother from his cage. Then the two of them fled that terrible house into the white snow of the dark night. But it wouldn't be that easy, would it, children? No, the house meant to keep them there. Every turn they took led them back to it one way or another. Perhaps we should have let ourselves be cooked and eaten, Natsu wept. I feel as if I'm burning all the same. Don't say that, sister, said Haru. We'll find our way. The wind has confused us, that's all. We're not giving up. But on that infernal wind, they heard the sound of distant crying. Oh, brother... Oh, brother, said Natsu, what demon hunts us now? Will this forest be our grave? Haru did not speak. His eyes had grown wide, and he pointed before them to a figure who had suddenly and silently appeared in the moonlight. And what did Haru see? But a beautiful woman dressed all in white, with long dark hair falling like water down to her feet. Her eyes, said Natsu, for the strange woman had none, only dark holes. But there were no scars, not like the lady of the house, and this woman seemed young, yet, at the same time, impossibly old. The children found themselves frozen in place as the woman drifted toward them, her feet not even touching the snow. She then placed a white hand upon Natsu's back. The girl cried out and collapsed in the snow at once. Sister! Haru cried, but Natsu, gasping, stood again. No, it's all right, brother, she said. The pain is gone. It, it doesn't burn anymore. When she turned, Haru saw that the ragged burns from the stove door would but faint scars where the snow woman had touched Natsu's back. Listen to me, children, said the snow woman in a soft, ghostly voice. I am the one who appeared to you as the widow, but you know now that this was an illusion. I am Yukiona, but I will not harm you any more. I have done enough. Your father betrayed me long ago when he told me he loved me and then married your mother, but he was only human. In my heartache, I forgot the innocence of children, your love for one another, and the tragedy you have already suffered, has made me realize how I have wronged you both. I must make amends for what I have done. Will you let us live? asked Haru. Will you take us home? asked Natsu. Yukiona smiled and gestured behind them. Far away in a clearing, the children saw another woman wandering. And that woman was their stepmother. Oh, what treachery was this? Ah, but then the snow woman raised a pale finger to her lips. Haru and Natsu stared as their stepmother stumbled along in the snow, calling out to them, unaware they were watching her all along unaware that they saw the moonlight glinting off a blade she carried. Haru! Natsu! she called. 
Are you near? A most elegant noblewoman came to me and told me you were out here. Oh, how worried I have been. I should never have sent you two out alone. How lucky that someone took you in. What a careless mother I have been. She walked along, idly twisting the edge of that knife into the trees as she passed. Natsu, Haru, come to me, she called out. I'll take you home to father where it's warm. Yukiana bowed her head to the children and flew toward their stepmother before disappearing in the blast of snow. What does she mean to do? asked Haru, who was answered by a sudden sound like glass shattering. Shards of ice, clean and sharp as daggers, plunge from the sky and pierce their horrid false mother all at once. Instantly her blood froze as it rained down upon the forest floor. With one last shriek, she fell down, dead. A whisper on the air addressed the children one last time. Tell your father he is free now. Tell him no harm will come to you from anyone ever again. Look, said Natsu. Another figure approached. Father, he raced toward them and collapsed. Haru Natsu, my own, he wept, and he threw his arms around them, holding them tight. Father, father, how did you find us? the children cried. Your stepmother confessed the truth to me, and I cast her out. When I saw that she had taken a knife, I knew she meant to hurt you, said their father. I lost track of her, but no matter. I have found you. How did you survive all these weeks in this place? Haru and Natsu turned to show him the house of Yukiona, but there was no house, only ruins of a place that hadn't stood for a hundred years or more. Some say the little family returned to the inn and never spoke of the stepmother again. They say that the woodcutter married once more, a blind woman, I'm told, of remarkable kindness and beauty. Others say this is only a story, though no one knows how the inn and the children who lived there escaped all possible injury, despite all that happened to the rest of the village over the years. Well, what do you think, little ones? Ponder this as you sleep. And you will sleep, won't you? Because if you don't, well... <laughs>